This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to talk about a really interesting story that brought an anthropologist and an archaeologist together after Superstorm Sandy. We find out more about the discovery of skeletal remains from a colonial burial ground. And what else was unearthed when the storm toppled a mighty oak on the New Haven Green? That's later. First, Where We Live has devoted several shows recently focusing on history. Today we're spending some time on the dangers of oversimplifying history, specifically when Americans talk about the Holocaust. Most recently, politicians on the federal and local levels have used Holocaust imagery and references to criticize pandemic policies. What harm did these analogies cause? And how should we think about the ways the Holocaust is taught in our country? You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Joining me now on Zoom is Avi Noam Pat, Director for the Center of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut. He's also the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies. Avi, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me here today, Lucy. I mentioned uh, Holocaust analogies, specifically in the pandemic, but this has been going on for some time in recent years. Can you talk about um, these references and the danger they cause when they're used? Sure. So as you alluded to in your introduction, this is a a problem that has been growing uh, in recent years, and we see very frequent references to symbols of the Holocaust, analogies to the history of the Holocaust to make different sorts of political points. And this is not necessarily a new thing, this this attempt to politically manipulate the memory of the Holocaust to make certain points, but we're seeing it rise over the last couple of years, specifically over this past year, as we see different politicians invoke symbols of the Holocaust to protest Uh, regulations, restrictions about uh, wearing masks or uh, getting vaccinated, making allusions to Holocaust history, referencing politicians as Hitler or, uh, you know, uh, saying that uh, the the Gestapo is coming or that people are going to be forced to wear yellow stars. And of course, these are uh, gross misrepresentations. These are forms of distortion of the memory of the Holocaust. And in some ways, these are even denial of, of the Holocaust that trivializes and tarnishes the memory of the Holocaust. Uh, You mentioned the distortions that can lead to an erosion of memory. And that does appear to be what's happening. The idea that, you know, many of us learn about the Holocaust when we're in school. But, you know, it seems that there is a, a trend, a pattern of oversimplifying history. And so can you talk about that? Sure. You know, one of the things that's concerning is that here we are, we're we're in the year 2021, we're living over 75 years after the end of the war. And as we know, most of the last living eyewitnesses to the events of World War II and of the Holocaust are, are passing away. And so this reinforces just how important it is for us to teach this history and to do it well and to make sure that we have our facts straight. And uh, one of the problems and one of the challenges is that while we, for example, here in the state of Connecticut are a state that uh, technically requires Holocaust and genocide education, like many other states in the country, we don't provide a great deal of uh, resources to provide assistance for teachers in terms of how they should do it. And so what often ends up happening is that Teachers will fulfill the the mandate um, by perhaps touching upon it in a class or perhaps going off on their own and making sure that they attend workshops that are provided by institutions, universities to do their own research, to be able to teach it in their classes. But in many cases, uh, it's not an in-depth study of the history itself, or it's just taught with passing references to various symbols uh, of the war itself. So students might learn about a place like Auschwitz. They might hear about different ghettos. They might learn about some of the symbols and the dangers of the Nazi rise to power, but they're not really equipped with enough information to ask the serious questions that we should be asking about how a democracy can be subverted, how uh, people can, uh, you know, be seized by this type of murderous ideology to take the lives of others, how we should 
develop empathy for the experiences of many others. There, there's not enough time to, to deal with this topic in great detail. So it's just touched upon very briefly. Can you talk more specifically when we hear, especially in the pandemic, uh, politicians referencing the Holocaust, referencing Nazi Germany, this idea of the vaccinated and unvaccinated and wearing yellow stars? I mean, when we look back to what happened in 1941 and people who were forced to wear this star, they were marked for persecution and death. And when we think about pandemic policies today, the government even if people don't like it, is trying to save lives. And so the danger of conflating that. Right. So on the first level, you know, we have to, one of the things that, that when we see these illusions being made and we see sort of an attempt to make what is a completely false analogy, right? We have to confront these types of false claims with the facts themselves, right? And I think in many cases, um, individuals who uh, traffic in this sort of denial or distortion will sort of throw out opinions, throw out things that are simply factually incorrect that uh, belie any attempt to make any sort of reasonable comparison and throw them out as truth. And so we have to confront them with the facts themselves. So, for example, uh, an analogy that would uh, say that um, people who, uh, you know, want to resist mask or vaccine mandates are like Jews who are being forced to don yellow stars under Nazi Germany, under German occupation in Poland or other places. This is a historical analogy that uh, holds no water whatsoever, right? There is simply no comparing, on the one hand, uh, a local government or a state government, uh, you know, legislation here or an attempt in our state or on a federal level to protect our citizens to say, you know, you should wear a mask because this is in the interest of public health. You should get vaccinated because uh, we have scientific evidence that shows that this will prevent the spread of the virus, right? These are laws that are, or rules that are being passed to, admit, to keep people safe. And by the same token, if we actually look at the comparison to Nazi Germany, what's happening in Nazi Germany is that Jews are being uh, marked being specifically persecuted, being forced to don yellow stars, being removed from German society and culture, beginning a process of social death that is eventually going to facilitate the process of mass murder, right? These are the beginning steps that will lead to the final solution and the annihilation of European Jewry. And there's simply no comparison between the two, right? At the same time, right, to say, that, you know, to make comparisons. And I should say, Lucy, that this is not just something that's happening on the local level. This is happening internationally, right? So it's not just something that we see here in Connecticut or that we see, you know, politicians across the United States making. We have politicians in, in Europe making the same comparisons, you know, uh, in, in France, uh, there you had a politician comparing Emmanuel Macron to, to Hitler, right? And again, the idea that you would have a politician comparing uh, uh, our governor or comparing the president of a country to uh, a genocidal mass murderer who was responsible uh, for the murder of six million Jews and the, the killing of millions of other innocent civilians in the course of the war, right? It simply is a historical analogy that makes no sense. So then we have to ask, go ahead. I just want to let our listeners know they're hearing Avi Noam Pat, director for the Center of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut. He's also the Doris and Simon, Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies. As we talk about uh, politicians, as Avi mentioned, uh, internationally, uh, nationally in our country, even locally, uh, using uh, references to the Holocaust and Nazi Germany uh, to criticize pandemic policies. Uh, you can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. So you just referenced a, a state Republican and Dauphiné. Um, she represents Plainfield and Danielson uh, in the news recently because uh, she wrote online, quote, King Lamont, a.k.a. Hitler, dictating what we must inject into our bodies to feed our family. Um, you know, again, uh, she was um, criticizing uh, the vaccine, a mandate for state employees, uh, some state employees uh, because they don't 
want to get vaccinated or refuse to be tested weekly have been fired by the Lamont administration. Uh, so when we think about this uh, politically, you know, also uh, the harm it causes, how it impacts uh, you know, vaccine hesitancy and, and mask wearing, Avi. Yeah, and you know, I think that this is part of a of a larger, very prob- problematic phenomenon that we're seeing in our society, right? So, on the one hand, it's easy for politicians to you know sort of throw out um, incendiary comments, right? It it attracts a lot of attention, right? It it generates buzz, it generates clicks, people pay attention, and it generates coverage, right? And so we know that it helps uh, to generate traction for those politicians and garner attention for their attempts to make these types of comparison. Um, at the same time, right, it's it's not only very troubling from a historical standpoint, as we were talking about before, the fact that this is a type of distortion, right? It's, it's something that trivializes the memory of the Holocaust, right? It's sort of, um, it, it not only is factually inaccurate, it at a period of time where we're sort of living through the passing of the last generation of survivors, we have the event itself being trivialized, the memory of the survivors, the memory of the victims. Throwing out these analogies trivializes their memory and it diminishes the significance of the event, which frankly is something I'm very concerned about as we can see as time goes on, it's gonna be much easier for people to deny that uh, the Holocaust ever happened once survivors and eyewitnesses are not there. And so this is where I think also we have to ask, why are people making these analogies, right? Why is it that the Holocaust is the symbol that that is invoked? You know, why are we not talking about other historical events that are invoked as symbols? And so on the one hand, I think there's a familiarity with with some elements of the history of the Holocaust. We know that it's gonna trigger people and get them riled up and get them angry. But I also think that there is a connection to other, frankly, anti-Semitic ideologies that are out there, other types of conspiracy theories that like to use anti-Semitic imagery to um, invoke protest or to protest government policy. And so in some way, these, these go hand in hand, right? So it's not surprising that we'll see politicians who are protesting government mandates using uh, symbols from the Holocaust, and that at the same time, symbols from the Holocaust, be it the Yellow Star, be it Auschwitz, are also used by anti-Semitic movements that really are flourishing online today in ways that are simply terrifying, right? It, it, it might have been that in the past, it would have taken years for somebody to pay attention to a Holocaust denier who was writing a pamphlet that you would have to find in a bookstore. In this day and age, right, you can put your ideas out there and they spread very quickly on Facebook and other social media platforms that I'm very worried that it's it's spreading so quickly and so broadly. Right. We're focusing on the political rhetoric uh, currently uh, related to the pandemic. But, you know, we all remember when Donald Trump was in office, uh, people uh, also called him Hitler. That is also wrong, Avi. Yeah, I, I, I think that any political distortion, any political use of the memory of the Holocaust, right? And and I want to be very specific here, right? The idea that someone is going to use the memory of the Holocaust to trivialize and tarnish the memory of the Holocaust to use any polit- to make any political point, right? It simply is a form of trivialization. It diminishes the significance of the event. And so I, I think it shouldn't be used in, in political discourse, right? I think we have to use it in an educational sphere, right? We have to teach it. I believe that very strongly. We have to learn lessons that will help us strengthen our democracy and make sure that we develop empathy for the experiences of others and learn about history and learn why historical facts are are important, right? And learn why historical facts must be documented and defended and truth, as we know in our day and age, is constantly under attack. And this is why we have to teach history and make sure that there are certain historical truths that are documented and defended. But at the same time, I think that we have to be very careful about any political uses that diminish the history of the Holocaust or other genocides as well.
This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. My guest, Avi Noam Pat, Director for the Center of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut. If you're on the line, we'll take your call right after a short break. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is Avi Noam Pat, director for the Center of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut. As we talk about why using Holocaust analogies to criticize current government policies is problematic. Even before the pandemic, Americans from different political affiliations have invoked Nazi Germany comparisons, whether in the news or on social media, to criticize government leaders and policies. But do these frequent distortions about the Holocaust point to a need for better Holocaust education in our country? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Tom's calling in from Manchester. Tom, what did you want to share? Yeah, good morning. Yes, um, I'm of African-American background, and I agree that um, the Holocaust is a unique human tragedy, but as a person of color, we got to look at also other genocides. Before that, in um, Germany, in 1905, it tried to wipe out some African tribes, which is known as Namibia, and also um, my late father was a World War II veteran, so he fought in the segregated army, so we had the double V fighting against fascism there and against the Japanese, but racism back here. And I feel like when they're using that analogy about the anti mass it's, it's very wrong with, you know, Hitler and, and you know, coming down on the governor because um, fascism is raising his ugly head with you know, remembering Franco and Mussolini, and as a person of color, what his forces did in Ethiopia with poison gas and, you know, just prior to World War I, um, and I think they were ousted in 1941 after six years of occupation. Um, I'm, I'm for human uh, freedom. So, yeah, I think we need to get that in there. And I think some people oh. deal with America. I'm sorry, America. Tom. Yeah. Tom, it sounds like your your phone is breaking up. But thank you for, for your comment. Uh, Avi, did you want to respond to Tom? Sure. And and I completely agree with, with Tom's point, right? That is that, you know, we're, we're on this program today. We're talking specifically about uh, analogies that are being made, historical analogies that are just factually inaccurate and dangerous that are uh, comparing contemporary policies to the Holocaust or the Nazi Germany. But I completely agree with Tom's point that it's incredibly important for us to, and, and frankly, when the legislation was passed in 2018, it specifically said that we need to ta teach about the Holocaust and we need to teach about genocide. And I think, you know, that to Tom's point, which is very well taken, it's if we think about the resources that are available for us to teach about the Holocaust, there's actually a lot of information that's out there, right? You have the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum that provides resources. You have different national organizations that provide resources for teaching about the Holocaust. We have far fewer resources for teaching about other genocides from history. So Tom, for example, referenced and actually have a, a colleague at UConn who does work on the genocide of the Herero, right? This, this um, you know, uh, case in Namibia that, that he was referencing in the beginning of the 20th century that we can see as sort of a, a prelude to, to German policies in Africa that would be, but would be experimented with, implemented to much greater um, uh, extent during the Second World War. But other genocides, right? The Armenian genocide as an example, the Rwandan genocide, we can think about our need to, to teach about um, you know, the, the treatment of Native Americans in this country here in our, in our very own state, right? There are so many cases that we're not teaching about that I think are incredibly important for us to teach about. And I'll just mention that you know, I'm, I'm at the University of Connecticut and the Center for Judaic Studies is part of the, the Dodd Center where we just had the rededication on Friday with President Biden coming. And I'm very proud to work with colleagues who are 
involved at the Dodds, now the newly named Dodds Center for Human Rights, um, my colleagues Glenn Matoma and Kathy Liebal there, that we're working very closely together to try to develop actually a certificate program in Holocaust and genocide studies to provide resources for teachers to do just this, to teach both about the Holocaust, but also to teach about other cases of genocide throughout history that need to be taught about. When we talk about Holocaust education in this country, Avi, you know, when did it really start to pick up? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so, you know, the truth is that when survivors first started coming to this country after the Second World War, um, there, there was a, a misconception that, you know, they didn't want to talk about their experiences. And the truth is that um, survivors were talking quite a bit amongst themselves about what they had endured. Um, and there were many commemorations that took place, but there wasn't a great deal of interest from uh, the, the broader public and specifically, you know, their, their new American neighbors and fellow citizens in what they had endured, right? There was a sense of don't dwell on the past. Why don't you focus on the future? And it's really not until, you know, a number of turning points and in, in 1978, there was an NBC miniseries called Holocaust, which actually starred Meryl Streep, a young Meryl Streep. And um, there was actually a, a neo-Nazi march in Skokie, Illinois, in that, in that same year in 1978. And then President Carter actually created the uh, Holocaust Memorial Council, which eventually led to the creation of the Holocaust Museum in 1993. And so it's really during the 1980s where you start to see survivors offering testimonies. Uh, the Fortune of Video Archive at Yale starts to collect uh, Holocaust survivor testimonies in the 1980s. And then in 1993, the museum is opened in Washington. Schindler's List comes out in 1993. And we start to see different states like New Jersey, New York, Florida, mandate that the Holocaust and genocide be taught as part of uh, the statewide educational curriculum. So that starts in the 1990s. But, you know, it's only in recent years that we've seen many more states adopt it. Like we here in 2018 required Holocaust and genocide education, and many other states now are also requiring it in recent years. When we talk about the state mandate to teach the Holocaust and genocide in public schools, I mean, what do we know about how effective this mandate has uh, been for uh, you know students uh, learning this course? I mean, is there a specific uh, time frame or um, outcomes that we can judge that this is actually helping uh, students understand uh, these events? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. So. A number of us have been working together to try to sort of see the the impact, um, the effectiveness, and you know, there's there's a group of us both from an organization that's called uh, Voices of Hope, which is uh, an organization that's created by descendants of survivors living in our state, and working together with uh, the ADL that's been very helpful in in um, implementing Holocaust education efforts in the state and colleagues at, at CCSU and, uh, you know, Michael Bloom at the Jewish Federation Association of Connecticut, we've all been working together to try to assess the impact and the effectiveness of this, of this mandate. And the truth is that, um, you know, the way that Connecticut works, so we do not have a statewide curriculum that has been developed. We, we have local control here in, in our districts, right? So every town can decide how they want to teach it. So it's really a mixed bag in terms of how it's being taught. You know, is it covered as part of the social studies curriculum for a day or a week or a semester, right? You have different teachers teaching it differently. And there are some incredibly dedicated teachers who spend, um, you know, a whole semester, a whole year focused on the topic. And then in other places, it might be touched upon for one day as part of a modern world history class. So, um, you know, there's really a wide range of, of, of how it's being taught. And we have to do much more work in terms of measuring the effectiveness, right? Um, you know, is it uh, developing greater empathy? Is it developing greater historical literacy? You know, is it being integrated into the way that language arts is being taught uh, with social studies at the same time. There's so much more work that we have to do to, to make sure that it's being done well. 
Uh, Christina emailed uh, Connecticut Public Radio um, after all the news related to Representative Dauphiné's uh, comments, and she just wanted to uh, tell everyone uh, from her perspective, when Nazi Germany is talked about, it's important to not overlook uh, the consequential damage to occupied Poland and beyond. Uh, she goes on to write, uh, the occupied nation was the epicenter of the war crimes, including the systemic genocide of the Jewish population, which began in the middle of the war, and that every Polish-American family that she knows has a story. And is that also important to, to remember, Avi, as we, as we think about ways to strengthen education about history in general? Yeah, no, I think, so, you know, it's it's, uh, to Christina's point on the on the one hand, right, we have to, I think in general, we have to do a much better job about teaching about history and also teaching about World War II, right? So we're still sort of living through the after effects of this incredibly calamitous event, the, the destruction that happened in Europe in the Second World War and still trying to learn those lessons. So, you know, if we're teaching about um, the history of World War II and the history of the Holocaust, Absolutely, right? Poland was the epicenter of the Holocaust. You have 90% of the Jewish population of Poland, so 3 million Jews out of a pre-war population of 3.3 million are murdered um, in Poland during the Second World War. And Poland is, you know, the, the target of um, Hitler's expansionist goals and Slavs are targeted specifically and the Polish elite and the Polish intelligentsia are targeted specifically throughout the course of the war. Um, at the same time, you know, I referenced before that there is a broader sort of international context that is taking place. So we're talking about the very local aspects of Holocaust analogies that are being made in Europe. At the same time, you know, a lot, I have a lot of colleagues who are very concerned about distortion that's taking place in the European context, sort of a rewriting of the historical record that's being that's taking place. So you have right-wing political parties in Europe, for example, that don't want to focus on sort of um, the, the history of what happened in these countries during the Second World War, don't want to focus on issues of complicity, you know, did local police play a role? Did the local population play a role in uh, turning over Jews? Did the local population collaborate with the Nazis? They'd rather not focus on that aspect of the history and say, you know, we should teach sort of a glorious past that we can be proud of. And this is part of a broader sort of internationalization of right-wing movements that are trying to re rewrite their own national histories. So we have it both here in this country, right? Sort of a sense of, you know, let's not talk about um, uh, uh, racism in this country. Let's not talk about legacies of slavery. Let's focus on the positive aspects of our history. And we can see in, in European context as well, right? Why so much focus on the Holocaust? Let's not talk about collaboration and complicity during the war. Let's focus on the positive aspect. So, um, you know, this is part of a, a bigger whole in terms of the right that we have to be very concerned about happening internationally. And Avi, uh, last question for you. I'm sure you have a response to, you know, put a, to put a fine point on what we've been talking about uh, this hour, you know, how these distortions lead to erosion of memory and the denial of the Holocaust, even in, in current events uh, with uh, the fervor around what should be taught in schools in Texas, a South Lake school leader telling teachers to balance Holocaust books with, quote, opposing views. What was your reaction to that? Right. Uh, yeah. So, and I, and I have to tell you, Lucy, I actually, I actually grew up in Texas, right? I, I grew up in, in Houston. And so I sort of saw that and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, this, this idea that, and that, you know, there, there are opposing views, right? That, you know, you can teach the history of the Holocaust, but you also have to teach opposing views. And I think this is just so, so dangerous because one tactic of the deniers is to basically make an outrageous claim and present it as if it's truth, right? Lies are not the same as facts, right? There are certain things that are objective truths that cannot be disputed. And when you say, right, that, um, well, let's, let's put it out as my opinion and see if there's, a, there's an opposing opinion which I can counter it with, 
this is very, very dangerous, right? This just leads to an erosion, not just of the memory of the Holocaust, but of the significance of historical fact and truth. And if I can end with one thought, which is that, you know, I, I was at the Dodd Center dedication on, on Friday and Rabbi Lazowski, who I appeared with mm. here with you three years ago on the program, he delivered this very meaningful invocation where he talked about sort of the meaning of, of his survival and, and that he couldn't believe that, you know, he would be here 75 years later delivering an invocation to a sitting U.S. president who had come. But I also think that for, for the survivors of the Holocaust, it's really, really troubling and quite scary to think that they've lived through these events, they've survived, they want to make sure that we learn the lessons of them. And then we have people standing up and saying, well, let's present opposing uh, points of view, right? There is no opposing point of view. There is no sort of alternate fact, right? We have to defend these historical truths and we have to do it for the victims and we have to do it for the survivors. And it's going to become even harder for us to do as time goes on. But that means that we just have to work that much harder to defend the truth. Avi Noam Pat, Director for the Center of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut. A pleasure to have you back with us. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Lucy. Avi mentioned that conversation I had with Rabbi Lazowski. Uh, we'll tweet and share that at where we live. Uh, a, a wonderful man and important to remember the stories of survivors. Uh, coming up, we're going to shift topics completely and talk about some local history. After Superstorm Sandy hit in 2012, there was an unsettling discovery on the New Haven Green. Today, we'll find out more about that discovery and how it provides clues to life in 18th century Connecticut. More after the break. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Halloween 2012 in Connecticut was one for the record books. Remember when Trick or Treat was canceled thanks to Superstorm Sandy? That storm also led to a surprising discovery, a discovery that brought an anthropologist and an archaeologist together. And it all started when a mighty oak, at least a century old, toppled on the New Haven Green. Joining us now with more on Zoom is Nick Bellantoni, Emeritus State Archaeologist with the Connecticut State Museum of Natural History. Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Lucy. Thanks for having us. Also with us is Gary Aronson, who's the manager at the Yale University Biological Anthropology Laboratories. Gary, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Lucy. So Nick, take us back to, what was it, Hallow's Eve 2012? What exactly was discovered when that oak toppled? Well, more trick than treat, that's for sure. <laughs> but basically, with a, you know, a Superstorm Sandy, if you remember, the Audi was a devastating, but it, it kind of circled around and came in from the east to west. And when it did, as you mentioned, it toppled a, a large oak tree called the Lincoln Oak because it was um, planted in 1909 to acknowledge the 100th anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, when it did, it... it fell the tree root mat and all so it didn't snap the tree the roots and all came up out of the ground and within the next day or so uh people walking on the new haven green recognized that there were skeletal remains bones in the root mat embedded and of course uh, the new haven police department came in then uh it was transferred to the uh, state medical examiner's office because the first inclination was that it was in fact part of a, a, a modern criminal investigation, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, when the, the medical examiner's team uh, saw that the remains were, in fact, old because of cortical loss and decomposition, uh, that's when uh, Gary and I got called in to help conduct the, the rest of the investigation. So um, it basically was a, it was a complete surprise and uh, um, quite startling for the Halloween season. Right, totally creepy. And so tell us more, since it's been a few years since these remains were discovered. Uh, so they weren't related to a modern uh, criminal investigation, but to an, a, a colonial burial ground, Nick? Yes, that's exactly right. Few people remember or, or, or know that the New Haven Green 
was the actual, the original burying ground for the city of New Haven, going way back to when Eaton and Davenport founded the cities in the 18, uh, 1630s. So for almost, for over 200 years, that was the main burial ground. So, uh, you know, we don't even know how many uh, burials are still underneath the green, but, uh, you know, we've kind of lost that public memory of it. Uh, what happened was when uh, the, the tree toppled, uh, the remains were uprooted with it. And that was quite startling, just simply because from an archaeological point of view, because when you think about burials, burials are down four, five, maybe even six feet deep. And yet the root mat only extended two and a half to three feet. So I suspect what happened was by the time the, the green ceased being used as a cemetery, probably around the 1800s, um, that there's been a lot of landscaping at the green for its potential today. So, so soils had probably been moved. Hence, those burials are shallower in the ground and thus affected by the, the root, uh, the root uh, mat. Uh, Gary, you're a biological anthropologist. So tell me when you took the call and, and how do you go about uh, you know, studying uh, these remains uh, to find out you know, the clues of what they can tell us uh, from uh, the 18th century, I believe? Well, I've been very fortunate to work with Nick and with other archaeologists around the country and the world um, in trying to examine what it is that um, skeletal remains or dental remains can tell us about a person's life. Obviously, um, as you pointed out, when you're dealing with uh, fragmentary elements or limited number of skeletal material, um, it gets a lot more complicated to try and work out what happened. However, um, a thing to remember about bones is that bones uh, are alive, even though they're hard tissue, um, they reflect many aspects of your individual uh, life, um, your ancestry, uh, your health and nutrition, and even potential markers of disease or stressors. And so in this particular instance, um, the root bed and the roots that were available really did an amazing job of keeping some of the individuals in relatively good condition um, to allow people like myself and my colleagues the opportunity to look at these skeletons to try and learn about uh, what I term individual life histories, or in other words, trying to ascertain based on what elements are available um, what we can say, not just about the sex and age of an individual, but also kind of what their lives were like, which then may reflect some aspects of their cultural, their social or their economic existence as well. So what did you glean after you and your colleagues studied these remains? How many individuals and, um, you know, so many of us in the general public, we watch those forensic shows. So <laughs> did the teeth really help you in, in terms of, of figuring out a little bit more about these uh, remains and who they might have been? Yes. Um, so the important thing to keep in mind is that many aspects of science and even the work that we do um, in osteology uh, are very much a team effort. There's only so much that I'm able to describe or determine. We've worked with researchers and colleagues at Knipiak University, the University of Florida, Santa Cruz, um, University of, uh, I'm sorry, many other institutions as well, I apologize, but to try and look at all of these different aspects of the individuals. And so six individuals were identified, um, their degree of completeness and the number of elements or teeth present vary from person to person. However, by looking at the elements and their structure, we're able to identify that both adults and some children had been recovered. Looking at isotopic analyses about aspects of diet and nutrition, we're able to understand a little bit more about the kind of foods that were available to that those individuals and to the New Haven population in the late seven, late 18th century as well. Um, and also using radiography to try and look at some subtle aspects of bone or dental um, health issues that may not be visible to someone like me um, using my eyes alone from an osteological perspective. Uh, Nick, I understand that the skeletal remains, they weren't the only thing that uh, the team discovered. What else was at the New Haven Green? Well, it, within the root mat, when that came up, it, it also dislodged a, a memorial stone that was dedicated, told the story of the Lincoln Oak. Uh, that stone turns out it was embedded as a kind of a foundation into a barrel of cement. And while we uh, removed that, um, 
we didn't realize that inside was uh, two um, time capsules. And one local historian had done some research on newspaper accounts of that uh, um, uh, of that planting of the tree. And in the newspaper accounts, it noted that two time capsules were buried with uh, uh, the, the planting. So, you know, we didn't see it. We couldn't find it. And uh, But we hypothesized that it might be in the cemented base of the barrel. Now, the barrel's wood has long gone, but the, the blue stone and the cement was there. Well, as Gary said, working with our colleagues at Quinnipiac University in their diagnostic imaging lab, um, we were able to f- kind of find a, a distinct well, the, uh, the shadow in the in the cement, and so when we cut into the cement, we found two copper uh, cylinders, and they were probably about four or five inches in diameter, probably uh, you know about uh, not quite a, a foot long. And we immediately brought them to um, Quinnipiac University, where the diagnostic, not diagnostic imaging um, team, um, X-rayed, CT scans. We we knew everything that was in that t- those time capsules before we actually opened them up uh, and and reviewed them. So what did we find? Well, we found uh, <laughs> nine newspapers. Uh, dating to 1909 and in February for the uh, for the anniversary of Lincoln's birth, um, turned out back then you know before radio, before TV, before internet, you got your news on uh, newspapers. So there were actually nine daily and weekly newspapers in in the city of New Haven alone. Uh, they were all represented, but we also found. Um, some very interesting artifacts from Gettysburg, uh, um, a grape shot, a mini ball, and also mem- more, m- memorable uh, coins and so forth dedicated to Abraham Lincoln. It was uh, planted by um, the uh, uh, Grand Army of the Republic post, uh, the foot post, and uh, they, uh, they, um, uh, they had all of the materials in there, including uh, the dedications, sermons, and, and presentations, and so forth. So, quite interesting because you know people have been telling me about uh, the time capsules for a long time in Connecticut. I've never found any until the New Haven <laughs> Green. So it's quite exciting for us. You're hearing Nick Bellantoni here on Where We Live, Emeritus State Archaeologist, also Gary Aronson here, who's manager at the Yale University Biological Anthropology Laboratory, as we talk about uh, this amazing find on the New Haven Green after Superstorm Sandy in, in 2012. Nick, I understand people call you Connecticut's Indiana Jones. So were you pretty excited through all of this? Uh, <laughs> which <laughs> I would have taken a blow dart to the neck in the first five minutes if I were Indiana Jones, so it wouldn't even have counted. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, you know, we've had a number of cases where skeletal mm-hmm. remains in Connecticut were uncovered either through construction or other kinds of processes. Uh, however, um, you know, the, the, the stock reminder of our past that is kind of lost to us. People picnic on the New Haven Green. They, they, they do public activities and don't realize that underneath – um, you know, it was a burial ground. And so it, 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 what I love about this is it brings us back to our past and it, it helps explain things a little bit better about who we are, where we are, and what we did on the land uh, prior. And with Gary's research, certainly uh, an understanding of health and, and disease uh, of our colonial ancestors. So, you know, it's just a, a, a wonderful kind of a dramatic, sensational reminder of, of the history beneath our feet. Right. Uh, Gary, I understand that you and Nick are going to be presenting uh, for the New Haven Museum uh, coming up a free virtual presentation that's going to give more details on your forensic analysis of the Lincoln Oak skeletal remains. Uh, what more can you tell us to preview that, that event? Well, the main thing we'll be trying to address is to look at aspects of things such as how the enamel that's present in the teeth of the individuals that were recovered show small striations or variations. So if you think of your own teeth when you look in the mirror, they're kind of mirror or glass-like. They're nice and even and show very little imperfections, at least uh, I'm assuming that through radio here. But nevertheless, the main point is that when you look at the pattern of enamel development that occurs 
as a baby is moving from the transition of birth into um, breastfeeding into weaning, a number of different energetic stressors, be it nutritional, be it disease, even maternal stressors can all be factors that can lead to slight changes in the deposition of enamel on teeth. These small changes are called linear enamel hypoplasias, and their presence are kind of markers of things like seasonal effects that might have occurred. In other words, some aspects of dental development may indicate some changes in seasonal availability of food. One of the main things that I'm going to be trying to describe in some detail is, again, trying to take these limited set of remains and the limited amount of information that are available from just these small select elements of individuals. But I believe, and I will hypothesize and support this by the available evidence, that the individuals tell us a little bit about the market economy, about the agricultural state, and other aspects of colonial New Haven uh, during this time. We're talking about a period of immense growth in the state, immense growth in the uh, city as well. And through research I've been doing over the past couple of years, looking at aspects of Connecticut's agricultural output, imports and exports, and other factors that might help explain some of the characteristics and features we see here, as well as the impact of epidemics um, that occurred serially throughout the colonies um, in the middle to late 1700s. Um, well documented on one side from a history of epidemiology perspective, but coming back to Nick's point, there are also ways to illustrate how through the discovery of artifacts, through the discovery of skeletal remains or dental remains, we can connect what is written or recorded in history, or sometimes what is not recorded in history, and then able to identify how there might be correlates or characters that are present in these elements and in these dental remains. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, if listeners go to our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live, there's a link if you want to register for this virtual presentation. That's Thursday, October 28th. Uh, before we run out of time, uh, Nick, just a couple of minutes left or a little less. Uh, what happened to the spot of the Lincoln Oak? Well, actually, what they did is once they removed the tree, uh, uh, the oak was cut up and, and, and given to local artists who... Um, who then carved some beautiful, uh, you know, images that was on exhibit at the New Haven Museum, along with uh, artifacts from the time capsule. Uh, so the the area was restored, and a new tree was planted. Uh, hopefully, a new oak tree that will bloom and stay up, uh, the, or maybe in a hundred years, another archaeologist will come by and have to deal with it. But the the uh, it was replanted, and we're hoping when when the analysis is completed that those remains will be reburied on the New Haven Green or somewhere appropriate um, in the very near future. So we'll put closure to the, the whole project. What a fascinating story. Thank you both for coming on the show. Nick Bellantoni, Emeritus State Archaeologist, and Gary Aronson with the Yale University Biological Anthropology Lab. Today's show produced by Tess Terrible. I'm Lucy Nalpithanchel. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. You can learn more about the show anytime. Just download Where We Live on your favorite podcast app. Back tomorrow. <laughs>